Her zany, intoxicating, moody, and highly critical mother once said, Silken ain't no saint. The indomitable Olympian motivator ambassador Silken Lauman not only defied the untruth thrown at her by her mom, she had the guts to dig deep, face her demons, and make peace with her perfect, imperfect self. The lumps, bumps, stars, scars, bad notes, and bell notes that keep her rowing through life. Even though she's not all that fond of swimming, I hear tell, her memoir is titled Unsinkable, and it won't become a Disney movie. I don't think it will become no, a, Disney think movie, be a Disney movie. No, I don't think it will be a Disney movie either. Unless they go to the uh, darker side. Yeah. And don't we all have one? We in our all life? have one. Yeah, we all do, and we all have our bumps and bruises. And uh, it was the right time in my life to share those bumps and bruises with with the public. When you say the right time, mm -hmm. why the right time? You know, Fanny, I feel like. I've always been fairly open about my life. You know, um, I remember when I went through my divorce, I wrote an article for Chatelaine. Um, in my speeches, I brought my personal life into my presentation. So over the last six or seven years, as I really started to uncover my life and I guess, you know, heal, heal my life, um, it felt like the right time to, to, to really share more openly and take that kind of two-dimensional person that we, you know, I think we all have a tendency uh, to do that with our heroes, whether they're athletic or otherwise, and tell the deeper story as I started to understand the deeper story of what made me who I am today. Of course, and if we don't uh, discover our messy, miserable bits mm -hmm. and bring them to the surface, then the word that is overused, authentic, yeah. doesn't really ring, does it? No, no, and I and and you know, I, in my speaking life and in 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 my writing, I'd always always talk to people about being the best that they could be. Something that I am still passionate about. Like I think you know, right till the dying day, you should be you know uncovering and discovering and and exploring. Um, but you know, I realized like in, inside myself, some of my deepest, darkest stuff I really hadn't dealt with and processed. And what I was really doing was just stuffing it down. I'm sure. Or did it really happen? Was it that bad? Yeah, well, of course. In your house, let's go back to your house. Uh, young Silken, uh, the siblings, a mother who's <laughs> mercurial, moody, a little tortured, uh, artistic, mm -hmm. but there were flying plates. There were flying and, plates. And uh, mean words, a lot of them. Yeah, I think the hardest thing about growing up with my mom was not knowing, like not, you know, not, not knowing what to expect when I came home, what, no, waking up in the middle of the night to screaming and throwing plates. And um, she was desperately unhappy. And, and I guess her unhappiness often the focal point of it was the kids. Sure, unhappy and demanding. Yeah, demanding, and I think, quite frankly, I think she had an undiagnosed mental illness. Like so her behaviors were so extreme at times, it just it didn't make sense in the in the um, paradigm of healthy. Well, you write in here that your brother was so afraid at times he slept with a knife. Yeah, under his pillow. Yeah. He, I mean, I think that feeling of anything could happen um, pervaded the household, especially at night. And, I, and so my brother, unbeknownst to me for many, many years until he shared it with me, um, actually slept with a knife under his bed, yeah. And, and your father, uh, stronger, uh, obviously putting up with a lot too. Yeah, what you was know, your relationship like with him? It was it was stronger with my dad and is stronger with my dad. I mean, I guess uh, in family dynamics are so complex. No kidding. Right? And and this mm. was of course all happening in, in the '60s when we didn't talk about mental illness. We certainly didn't talk about what was happening at home. There are a lot of great things happening at home. Um, my mom was creative and artistic. My dad's athletic, but there was this constant uh, tension and anxiety. And so so I did sort of turn to my dad to a certain degree. And I think he was just trying to, you know, m make the bills, pay the bills, mm -hmm. and uh, have that balance, keeping my mom. I mean, I remember my dad saying to me pretty recently that he was really worried that my mom would uh, be institutionalized, and he wanted to keep her at home. And he was trying to keep it all together, I guess. Sure, and as part of this, uh, some of the immigrant experience, isn't it? You mm. come, uh, both of them East Germans? Um, originally. East and West. East, East and West, West. yeah. Uh, immigrate to Canada, lonely, uh, language problems, all of that. So that's a tough start. Yeah, and they lived through the war. I mean, mm. 
so since writing the book, I, I, I've heard from so many people who had similar experiences and often um, people coming from Europe having lived through the war you know not having the tools to process that being fairly young coming to a new country feeling isolated like you name it there's so many reasons for what went on and for the state that my mom was in but of course I was a kid I, I, I right. didn't understand them and didn't know how to process mm -hmm. them but you knew your mom was a bit different and you had to bring your girlfriends home and your boyfriends home yeah. and and did you explain mom or did you, did you just let it happen? I, you know, I, I don't think I had a way of explaining that. She was just mom. That was my reality. Mm. Uh, but certainly I went to friends' houses more often than they came to my house. Uh, she gave you lots of advice growing up and lots of criticism and, and some of the criticism was about your body and how you looked and all of that. Well, my mom was obsessed with her own appearance. She's a very beautiful woman, very slender and, and tall and blonde. And, you know, but she was obsessed with, the, with her appearances. And so um, there was these constant messages in, in our house around staying slender and beautiful and how important beauty and youth was. Um, I, I think I really rebelled against that in my um, early years uh, and didn't wear makeup. Um, but I also developed uh, an unhealthy relationship with my body. And spiraled into anorexia, in if that's the right word, in your teen years. Yeah, yeah and that was, a, that was a really difficult time. Um, I, I think that my eating disorder really stemmed from a desire to control. Mm -hmm. I mean, the house felt so un out of control and so unpredictable. And I think, you know, I internalized that and thought I could control my body. I was terrified of becoming a woman, becoming just like mm -hmm. my mom. I, I get that, and we all have that fear, being like, even if we have great moms, yes. we say, no, what just if like I her, turn yeah. into my mother? Yeah. I don't know what that's about. That's yeah. another topic, another day. It is. But uh, anorexia, a tough, uh, tough disorder, uh, tough to beat, and it stays with you, or they say. It I stays it with you. it does stay with you. I mean, it's an interesting... Most of I, your life. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, found the sport rowing, which really embraced healthy, strong bodies. I mean, you look at the rowers on TV, and they're, they're strong, they look healthy, and I think that helped me an enormous amount. In times of stress, in the times of extreme stress, I would always drop weight. Uh, when my marriage ended 10 years ago, I, I became anorexic again. Uh, and sport was, was your solace... In the beginning, was it your solace throughout? Is it still? I think sport, I know you're not rowing yeah. for the Olympics in the next yeah, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, the teenage years are, are, are kind of unique years anyhow. Everything you feel to a, a high degree, it's very intense. And I was mm -hmm. able to take that confusion, that... Um, self-loathing and I think direct it, direct it into something really positive which was sport. You know now I feel like sport is more my mental health, uh, getting out and exercising, doing mm -hmm. yoga. It's a way of balancing myself energetically. But growing up in turbulence as you know you need a safe place, you need, need a safe house. Yeah. Yours might have been in the single skull. Yeah. It, it could well have been, and I think a different kind of community too. You know, other people who cared about me outside my family, mm -hmm. um, who created a, a new kind of family community for me, and it was a place for me to hide too, right? Like in a way, when I was pursuing high-level sport, I didn't have to deal with those deeper issues because I was always competing, I was always driving forward. And you had a coach. And I had a coach. And most coaches, although they drive you hard, also tell you you're about the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, like it's there's very something affirming. about that. And it's a special relationship. I had a very special relationship with my coach, Mike Spracklin, mm. who led Canada to so many gold medals. What made him a good coach? Beyond everything, beyond his expertise, which was just incredible, uh, his caring for the athlete, he always put the athlete first. And he didn't, you know, so, some coaches wrongly really um, want to win for themselves. And he wanted the athlete to realize their potential. That's what gave him joy. Mm -hmm. He was one to sort of stand back and, and he, usually when the race was actually being run, you know, he'd go hide away from the cameras, away from everything and just watch the athletes right. themselves. And when you were hurt so badly and had to come back in Barcelona to win bronze, when I say had to, yeah. you did. Who helped you through that? Oh, I mean... Who anchored you through that mainly? 
Well, two of my good friends really were part of that. Marilyn Copeland and Peter Copeland took me into mm. their home and, and, and literally drove me everywhere and fed me and visited me in the hospital every day. They were huge supports. And certainly the, the, the inner belief that somehow, some way, like this, this challenge was so huge, it was so unlikely that I would get to the Olympics and win a bronze medal. But I think I had that belief that's almost unexplainable mm -hmm. um, that I was going to make it. Somehow you knew. Yeah. Uh, fame, mm -hmm. which came uh, more quickly than you expected in a sense. You win a bronze. Yeah. And because of your comeback, probably more fame than a, than a gold mm -hmm. at some level. Yeah. What was surprising about that? Well, you, for, you, you're right. It came overnight. I mean, I went from being, you know, sort of recognized if I explained my sport to literally walking down the street and having cars stop me and cab drivers getting out of their cabs saying, thank you for representing Canada. Um, not being able to go to the grocery store without people checking in my <laughs> grocery cart to see if I had, like, chips or <laughs> things right. in there. Um, and I, I think the challenge with it uh, is that although I can be very extroverted, I recharge by being very introverted. And my ability to disconnect almost was eliminated. Mm. I mean, no matter where I went, with it, whether it was a family function or to a friend's house, it'd be like, oh, I have this neighbor that really wants to meet you, or she has a daughter that's doing sport and we just want to have our picture taken. And, and it was great. I mean, it's a positive thing. It meant that, you know, in some way, somehow I'd been inspiring to these amazing young girls. Uh, but it didn't give me time to, um, to rebalance myself. And as I've learned more about myself, I've learned how important that time really is for me and that time of being alone. Well, you say in Unsinkable that, in a sense, the single skull, being alone in the, in the boat, was more your thing, better for your personality, than team rowing. Yeah, yeah, I think probably other people understood me better than I understood myself mm. for a long time. And, and I was a single scholar for a reason. I, I do like the solitude, uh, the miles and miles of just being on my own and, you know, getting into my own mind space. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like? I mean, rowing is an incredible sport. Uh, it's, such a, it's such a contradiction of, like, power and strength and aggression, you know, just to make that boat go and to be in an environment where you're, you're pushing to pass that person ahead of you. Uh, but it's also, like, so much finesse and tranquility and, and grace needed. Um, it was an amazing... I'm, I'm so grateful that I was able to compete in the sport for as long as I did. Mm -hmm. And sort of like life. Kind of like You need life. grace. You need toughness. Yes, you do. You do. And I, I think toughness... You, you, you know, obstacles happen to all of us. Like, some of my obstacles have been very public. They've been large. But, you know, talk to anybody. They've got their bumps and bruises. And I think the mistake that we make is thinking that it's going to be smooth. Wherever we're at, I mean, the thing that I learned when I went through depression was no matter how bad you're feeling, it's going to end. No matter how good you're feeling, it's going to end. I mean, things come and go. Emotions come and go. And I think the pain in it is becoming attached to, you know, it always staying the same. Mm -hmm. And yet when you are depressed, uh, uh, truly depressed, people will say, well, just get out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, and in your case, you're beautiful, you're Olympic rower. Mm -hmm. uh, at, that, uh, at one point you have uh, John, the, the rower husband. From the outside, you have everything a girl should want yeah. from the outside. We don't know each other's inner climates. Mm -hmm. Ra raising my children, I, I came to a real breaking point with, with my kids and um, realizing that I wasn't parenting the way that I wanted to, that this anger, this, this, this rage, which was really the flip side of depression for me, um, was, was revealing itself at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> you know? I get that, yeah. yes. And, and that... The, the, the idea that I would repeat um, some of the rage and some of the, the, the um, stuff that happened to me as a kid was so frightening to me. It was so scary to me that it literally drove me to get help. Uh, and for the first time in my life, in my 30s, I said, you know, I can't do this by myself. I need to right. reach out and get some and help. And the stigma around getting help. I, I, if you're in Hollywood, you say, well, I have three therapists. 
<laughs> it's kind of the thing to do yeah. when you're in, uh, you know, sport and whatever. Three therapists kind of doesn't make sense. Maybe a sports psychologist. Yes. But then yeah, someone says acceptable. to you, perhaps you need a pill. Perhaps it's your brain chemistry. Perhaps we can help. Yeah. Well, the, the, the idea of needing help for all of us, I think, is a pretty tough idea. For me, it, was, it meant weakness. In the beginning, when I first reached out for help, I really thought it meant that I was being weak. And when I got to the place of really recognizing that I needed to um, take a medication to help me, that was also like, oh, you know, right. I, I'm being so weak. I, you know, through the, through the journey that I've gone through, I've learned that being vulnerable is being strong. Of course, and, but you go back to healthy body, perfect body, body image, perfect brain, mind, body, spirit, perfect. And it just ain't so. It ain't so. Asoka Laman, our guest, her memoir, Unsinkable, and she is, by the way, uh, an ambassador, a cheerleader for the world, world without dieting. dieting, and we'll talk about that when we come back. <laughs>